streamed on the um, YouTube channel of the uh, Institute uh, for Comparative Federalism of the, uh, uh, at URAC. And today uh, we, we are coming to the end of this webinar series. And uh, so I would like to uh, give a special thanks to uh, Martina Trettel and Petra Malfertainer, uh, who supported me uh, with the very conception of this webinar series and uh, with the organization. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. And in this last part of the webinar series, uh, we have the pleasure to host for uh, leading international experts in the fields of federalism and non-territorial autonomy, who, whom I'm honored to introduce to you. Uh, firstly, uh, Professor Tove Malloy will be taking the floor. Tove Malloy is a former director of the European Center for Minority Issues and former full member and additional member of the Advisory Committee on the European Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. She is currently professor of European Studies at the Europa University of Flensburg in Germany and member of the Management Committee of the European Non-Territorial Autonomy Network. Uh, afterwards, uh, the floor will be yielded to uh, Frédéric Lepin, uh, who is Deputy Director General of the Centre International de Formation Européenne and lecturer in federalism and governance uh, um, at the Centre's uh, master programme. He is also editor-in-chief of the academic journal of the Centre, L'Europe en Formation, uh, founded by Alexandre Marc and Jean-Pierre Gouzy. His research mainly focuses on the history of federalist ideas and their connection with multi-level governance. Uh, Karl Kössler will be our third speaker. Uh, Karl is senior researcher at the Institute for Comparative Federalism at URAC Research, uh, where among other things, he leads the Logov project on local government and changing uh, urban-rural interplay. Karl is also a member of the Council of Europe's group of independent experts of, on the European Charter of, of Local Self-Government. He has authored with Francesco Palermo uh, the book Comparative Federalism, uh, the first comprehensive book dealing with federalism from a comparative constitutional law standpoint. And finally, uh, Professor Eva Maria Belser will take the role of a discussant. Eva Maria Belser holds a chair for constitutional and administrative law at the University of Fribourg and a UNESCO chair in human rights and democracy. Since 2008, uh, she has been co-director of the Institute of Federalism of Fribourg. And then uh, Eva Maria has uncountable further affiliations, among which uh, board member of the Swiss Center of Expertise in Human Rights, vice president of the Association of Centers for Federal Studies, member of the Swiss Ethical, Legal and Social Implication Expert Group of the National COVID-19 uh, Science Task Force. Thank you everybody for being here and for participating. And uh, allow me uh, just to address a few words about the organization of the webinar. As usual, uh, like in the other uh, two webinars, uh, I will uh, say a few introductory words about the subject uh, we are dealing uh, with uh, in this event and in this series in general. Uh, then uh, uh, there will be the three presentations uh, that will last around 20 minutes. And afterwards, Eva Maria uh, Belser uh, will take the floor and comment uh, on the presentations for around uh, 10, 15 minutes. Then uh, the floor will be open uh, for further discussion. And uh, so questions and comments are uh, warmly uh, welcomed. Those who uh, would like to participate, uh, asking a question or leaving a comment, uh, may write uh, in the chat tab and we will be pleased to give them uh, the floor. Also, written comments and questions are welcomed, uh, for sure. Uh, we will collect them and uh, pass uh, to the speakers. So uh, now, uh, before uh, leaving the floor to our speakers, uh, allow me uh, to say some uh, introductory words about this uh, webinar series. Since uh, this is now uh, our third and last event, uh, with this brief introduction, I'm just going to summarize the theoretical issues that we are engaging, uh, engaging with today. 
Our webinar series uh, is intended to take up uh, the theoretical challenge that our contemporary epoch is posing to several concepts that have developed and consolidated uh, in the framework of the national state era. This is the case with federalism and minority rights law, uh, which today are both uh, apparently undergoing a period of crisis and redefinition, which follows the evolution of the societal context in which they operate. As regards minority rights law, uh, the growing societal pluralism resulting from many factors and mostly from migration flows accounts for an increasing need and demand for accommodation of diversity. This dynamic has put under pressure the traditional instruments uh, of minority rights law, which rely on a specific idea of minority group and minority protection that in a way reproduces the national state logic or paradigm with its focus on ethnicity and territory. As a consequence, uh, this trend has in turn either inspired emergent practical and theoretical models for the accommodation of diversity or renovated the interest in some ancient ones. Among them, we include participatory democracy, legal pluralism and non-territorial autonomy. All of them may be seen as the expression of an approach or paradigm that complements the classic national paradigm underlying minority rights law and reflects the idea of diversity being a general phenomenon of our societies and not something that is only related to uh, traditional or national minorities. This rise of complexity in terms of society and legal instruments appears to need a theoretical recognition, uh, a name. This is why we employ the phrase, uh, the law of diversity. In terms of methods, the suggested phrasing uh, could be seen uh, as a gate opener expression that broadens our perspective in this field reconnecting traditional and contemporary models for the accommodation of diversity in constitutional systems. Also, this phrase suggests we refrain from framing diverse, diversity management only through the lens of minority rights. And for what concerns federalism, the contemporary epoch makes us once more reflect on the adaptability of this notion. The basic idea we are trying to test in this series uh, is that the institutional theorization of federalism as a territorial form of government may represent but one of the manifestations of a logic, a method common to many experiences. In a time of increasing complexity and interconnection among different sources of power, the focus on the institutional side of federalism could be limited. This might be the moment to explore the theoretical potential of federalism as a framework of understanding or as an analytical and explanatory tool uh, for studying the functioning and inspiring the development of phenomena that somewhat follow a similar logic. This is what we are trying to do in this webinar series with regard to participatory democracy, uh, non-territorial autonomy and legal pluralism. Today, as said, uh, our focus will be on non-territorial autonomy. We will therefore uh, seek to verify whether and to which extent federalism may be useful to theoretically frame this manifold model for the accommodation of diversity. Is it worth using federalism to understand and explain non-territorial autonomy? May this standpoint add anything uh, to our comprehension of this arrangement? Is it possible to frame non-territorial arrangements as federal arrangements? Uh, these are some of the questions that we are going, or we are trying to address with our speakers uh, today. And paraphrasing a sentence uh, that is attributed to Einstein that says, creativity is intelligence having fun. I dare say that uh, theory building is comparative public law having fun. So I wish all of us a lot of fun. Uh, that being said, uh, thank you again uh, for uh, being here and participating. And I immediately uh, give the floor uh, to Tove Malloy, 
whose uh, uh, the, the title of the, the presentation of Dov Malloy is uh, Linking Non-Territorial Autonomy and Federalism, Indicators and Entrenchment. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. I'm sorry, uh, Tove, you have to unmute your mic. Thank you very much. I will find my presentation and share it with all of you, I hope. Perfect, we, we see it, thank you. Can you see it? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, yes. good. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, Nicolo, and, and um, learning about your project is very interesting. And of course, we now find that we have uh, common ideas and common interests, but I, sh I should stress at the beginning that, of course, I'm not a scholar of federalism and I will not try to make evaluations in that regard, but my hope is that my talk will give you and the participants some food for thought uh, in support of your theoretical framework and the questions that uh, I will return to at the end of my talk. Probably my research falls under what you call alternative Oper operationalizations of federalism, but um, I'll leave that to others to judge. Um, but where we do overlap, I think, is in your proposal uh, to focus on um, alternative modes of accommodation of diversity and minority claims to protection of ethnocultural cultural identity and communities. So in political science, my research would probably be grouped under consortialist, consortialism. But recently uh, it has been put in contact with decentralization, which I think brings it in the direction of state models based on devolved power structures such as federalism. Uh, and my particular interest in non-territorial autonomy or NTA, um, is, is a non-territorial autonomy for ethnocultural groups without any territorial rights, but often with a specific territory or homeland as a defining marker of their identity. Uh, and that, uh, of course, comes in many, many different shapes and scopes. And my interest over the years has been to try and put some system into the models that I observe, most of which are in Europe. Uh, and this has led me down a path of, on the one hand, categorization, and on the other hand, what you could call excavation or discovery or something. But basically, in terms of categorization, it has been precisely in an effort to understand the difference between NTA and TA, meaning territorial autonomy. Uh, I wanted to question the rather popularized understanding of NTA as a substitute for TA in regions where ethnocultural groups do not live compactly together and therefore could not claim the majority of votes for a political position, for instance. Uh, and the view that NTA is in fact just unfinished territorial autonomy or territorial autonomy gone wrong or something like that, which has been promoted implicit by some scholars mostly who are not really observers uh, or, or study NTA. But when I looked at case studies in Europe, from the Baltics to the Balkans, I did not see models that were seeking to become territorial autonomy. Uh, so hence this look for categories. Um, and I believe that this aim might be useful for scholars of federalism who look for links between NTA and TA. And in terms of excavation, uh, I have recently with some colleagues begun to um, look for alternative and emerging models of NTA or what we might, what we might call paradigms. So ever since I started focusing on, on NTA, I have um, been surprised about the diversity in models and processes whereby NTA has emerged in a number of, of European countries. And what I see is a highly diverse picture of NTA models that have emerged for very different reasons, often dictated by very specific historical backgrounds and outcomes. Um, with the rise of minority protection, of course, as you just mentioned, and the minority rights regime in Europe, 
models of self-administration that draw on NTA ideas uh, have emerged in Europe. So most of these have um, only started becoming the focus of academics. And so we still have uh, fairly scarce knowledge uh, about these. Um, and it was actually this lack in the academic literature that led to the book volume, which I just published. And allow me to um, show you the cover here because it's an edited, edited volume with case studies from across the world. Um, unfortunately, I won't have time to explain these models today. They are described very well in, in the volume, uh, which is edited with my colleague, uh, Levinda Salat. Um, what I will talk about uh, are the indicators that we developed uh, for, for these case studies. Uh, and you can see that we also had, we had two theoretical approaches, which also I will not discuss, but if you're if people have questions uh, later on, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to uh, elaborate further and also some of the uh, case studies I can speak about. But the indicators were really what sort of was maybe my contribution to this uh, research project. And um, after reading and understanding the case studies, um, and in order to assess them, because they were very diverse um, in terms of NTA features, we devised this set of indicators that describes the degree of autonomy uh, in these uh, models. And we wanted to focus specifically on collective action and agency. So we develop, developed the following in terms of self-creating uh, of organizations, and institutions was our first indicator. We felt that the motivation and the drive was important here. The motivation to create uh, bottom-up uh, institutions and organizations. And then the second one was the ability to uh, have self-decision-making, meaning that the ability to take decisions independently from outside influence but of course, abiding by norms and standards of society. We felt that that would provide for both authority and legitimacy of the cases. And then we looked, of course, at self-administration and self-management of the institutions that were described in, in the case studies. Uh, and this, in a sense, is also um, an indicator of self-control. Um, uh, but also indicates capacity and competencies. And then the fourth one, uh, self-regulation, it refers to internal self-imposed rules that evidence a code of conduct implemented willingly in order to comply with external regulations, such as human rights standards, we felt this was important both for the internal acceptance of the model, but also for the external legitimacy that will secure maybe permanency of the model or the, the, the arrangement. And finally, the fifth one, self-adjudication, which is um, probably the most difficult one. It's an indicator of the potential to administer justice based on self-imposed rules, as well as willingness to, of course, abide by the external rules, but to have, in a sense, own, uh, own systems of dispute um, settlements. That is not something that we found in many examples, but we did find it. So basically, we focused on the indication of how ethnocultural groups um, living dispersed, of course, uh, have set up their own institutions in certain areas of public service delivery, such as in education, culture, social protection, and economic management. Uh, and the common denominator that allowed us to call these models emerging was that they all exhibited a degree of autonomy that they did not have before. So all the case studies were described as a new phenomenon in 
that particular country or region and so forth. And that then um, enabled us to look at this concept of degrees of autonomy, which we then, in a sense, um, are adding to the more sort of traditional strict thinking of autonomy as a legal system with the framework and, and so forth. And I'll get back to that. But um, a degree is precisely the key word to studying these emerging models because the level of power vested in these groups depends on both the contemporary state and nation building efforts. It depends on historical factors, but it also depends on the level of collective autonomy that an, or collective agency that an, a group is able to develop. So it, in a sense, it's a two-way street. I mean, if, if, if groups want to expand autonomy, uh, non-territorial autonomy in, in their cultural area, there needs to be, of course, a system for doing that, but there also needs to be the collective agency. So on the basis of this set of indicators, we were able to read some conclusions on these case studies, um, uh, basically regarding uh, the motivation to self-organize, the legitimacy of self-decisions, the control of administration and management, the self-control, the internal acceptance of self-regulation and the authority of adjudication. So, so um, these were all one or the other, not all of them, but most of them were found in the case studies. So the authority of adjudication was something which we found, for instance, in the case study from Romania, which was on the, on the uh, the CRIS system of dispute regulation within Roma communities. It's, it's a century old system which still exists, um, but also uh, internal uh, acceptance of self-regulation is something which we looked very closely at in the case of the Afrikaans in South Africa, uh, because um, there has been some issues regarding um, the openness and closeness of, in, of institutions and organization of the Afrikaans in Africa, and that um, we, we wanted to try to uh, assess a little bit. Um, so we came up with some preliminary conclusions, and I don't know if you can see all of them, and, but basically um, that the degree of bottom-up autonomy is dependent on collective agency, Resilience of a model is measured in the ability of NTA institutions to survive within the scope of the state framework. The higher the resilience, of course, the more likely the model would become permanent. And then we concluded that autonomy studies need to be open to other methods of study in order to take this theorization further. Um, so yeah, so all this is available in the book and I'm happy to answer more direct questions on this later. But using some of these indicators and the knowledge gathered in the case studies, I was able to, to get a step further in, in my work on categorization actually. Um, so I basically went back to some of the models that I know very well and applied the new knowledge on indicators. and. Uh, you could say that I went back to, to in a sense, to to take um, to undertake some reconceptualization of what I already knew and and was familiar with, and I um, I looked at three cases that I know very well: uh, Hungary, Finland, uh, and uh, Germany. And over the years, of course, there's been different ways of referring to. NTA among academics. I'm sure you're all aware of this. And most common one is probably cultural autonomy due to the relevant policies regulating NTA that usually focus a lot on cultural rights. However, 
legal experts have been willing to dig a bit deeper to find more technical definitions of NTA. And therefore we have um, scholars like Hans-Joachim Heinz, uh, uh, Michael Tasik and Marco Suksi who have elaborated, for instance, functional autonomy, which was, I think, coined by uh, Heinz, uh, legislative NTA by Tasik and administrative NTA by Suksi. And especially TASIC has developed a hierarchy of, of NTA um, based on legal entrenchment of models. Uh, so he has a, a, an inverted pyramid. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it here, but basically he has um, at the top in a hierarchy, he has legislative NTA, which is, is very broad because it has the legislative um, um, entrenchment. And then he has below that uh, administrative function, cultural and personal at the, at the bottom of an inverted pyramid. Um, however, since the models have, since all the models have some legislative foundation, depending on the depth of control, I searched for a more useful hierarchy. And what I came up with was then these three traditional, administrative, and functional. Um, and I will go through these three very quickly. I don't know how much time I have left, but um, the traditional model then, I, I used uh, somewhat the same indicators, the four of them from the previous research, uh, self-organization in terms of collective agency to establish institutions self-administration and self-management of separate institutions in terms of maintaining these institutions. Uh, Self-decision powers uh, in matters pertaining to the maintenance and survival of ethnocultural identities and traditions. And finally, self-regulation in terms of externally imposed rules and human rights. <coughs> and here, I don't know if you can see it, but basically the Hungarian model to me seems the most, um, how do you say, the most developed model in this perspective. So I used it, um, it it's rather complex, but basically the model, um, Hung Hungary has adopted a comprehensive legal framework for ethnocultural NTA through a combination of constitutional recognition uh, and a legal single act uh, that is applied equally to all recognized minorities in Hungary called nationalities. This law and nationality recognizes the, them as legal entities and provides them with the kind of self-governance which that actually is called self-government in this law. And it identifies, however, cultural autonomy as the aim uh, and it, it guarantees a variety of collective rights, uh, including self-government. Um, and it guarantees uh, elections to these self-governing units. And that usually follows the territorial, um, the normal general elections and, and local elections in Hungary. So at the same time, they uh, elect for their, they, they elect the self-governments, these ethnocultural self-governments. However, they don't have legislative powers. Um, there are in the law, there are detailed provisions for the internal structure of these self-governments, how they should function. Their competences are very well described. I mean, it's a law of 150 pages and half of it is on autonomy. And specifically with regard to functions and competences, it, specific, it specifies these as mandatory public duties. Uh, this is an obligation to share competences and co and act in co-governance with the state administration. Uh, and these duties include the maintenance of schools, uh, cultural institutions, the fulfillment of responsibilities delegated by local government. So local governments can give, uh, can devolve powers to these sub-governments, 
the duties are also related to maintenance of organizations that take over uh, from the state or local organizations. So that's public service delivery. Uh, and they're related to, the, of course, the interest of the community and um, creating equal opportunities to the enforcement of minority rights. So, so the, the duties are uh, involved in decision-making and in the cooperation. Uh, they serve to reinforce the cultural autonomy, of course, and um, operate these uh, different self-governments. In short, you can say that they are shared competences with duties attached to ensure that the administration of public service delivery in a greater variety of tasks in public and communal life uh, will be taken care of by the minorities. And quickly on, the, on politics and policy, the Hungarian government is obliged to consult uh, self, these self-government units uh, with respect to issues that relate to their uh, life. Um, and backwards also, the organizations have the, the possibility to consult governments and ask for um, explanations. Um, so again, duties are formulated very concretely. Uh, and they, each of these self-governments um, has a representative in the Hungarian parliament. It's called an advocate. It's, it's a representative without a vote who can sit, however, in a number of, of committees, and they can also ask questions. Um, so just to go quickly through this, um, there's also a right to consent uh, perspective here. Because of this consultation back and forth both ways, the, um, the state is, is uh, obliged to give the Hungarian uh, self-government uh, the option to consent to, for instance, a piece of legislation or program and so forth. But it is in, in a sense, they get a deadline. And if they don't answer before that deadline, it's considered a, a consent. So it's not a veto power as some people have maybe uh, considered it. So in other words, it's an agreement in Hungary that ensures co-governance at the national level on matters vital to the survival of cultures of nationalities. Um, and it's an agreement which is both top, uh, top down and bottom up uh, in terms of this uh, complex uh, duty system. So the next one, uh, do I still have some time? The next one is the administrative uh, maybe, model. Uh, five or seven minutes. Thank you, I will make that. Yeah. Uh, so the administrative model I'm, I'm uh, showing today is the Finnish NTA model, and this is the, um, the Swedish speakers living in mainland Finland. They live on the coast, they live uh, also in, in Helsinki, and um, they, they have through a very different system of administrative uh, NTA possibilities of some co-governance. So quickly, um, this is a, um, a, this is a um, system or an agreement whereby there is constitutional recognition for sure. And then there is uh, some universal, I call it, administrative act, meaning that the act is not just for the Swedish speaking community, but it's, it's, a, it's a national act for the whole country in which there then is very uh, dis distinct and very descriptive um, rights for the Swedish speakers. Um, so uh, they have this uh, mainly in the language area, but also in, the, uh, in education. And the um, indicators are the same as in the, the traditional model. This of course makes it a little bit confusing, but it's basically the same that we found that we could use. Um, and here, uh, I think I'll just skip that. We can turn, return to that. So um, what I argue here is that because of the way that there is not a one law on this particular ethnocultural group, 
I argue that rather than calling it an agreement, it, it's more an arrangement which is implemented through this uh, Universal Administrative Act on Languages. Um, but this act regulates the entire public administration of Finland and subsidiary, sub, subsidiary legislation has then been adopted in certain areas like higher education, local government, uh, public servant uh, personnel, etc. cetera. Um, but what, what has been argued by, uh, by Marco Suksi and what I agree with here is that because it's basically regulating language use across Finland, but of course uh, applied mainly where there is a, a, a considerable number of uh, Swedish speakers, it sort of becomes an indirect administrative, uh, administ administration uh, tool uh, that you can call part of the NTA model there. And um, quickly with regard to politics and policy making, the Swedish speakers have an assembly, which is a like a parliament uh, they can make their own decisions, um, but they don't have any legislative power uh, and they are uh, not really self-administrative self in politics. So unlike in Hungary, where there are really political units that have legal status, you don't see this in Finland. So this assembly is a consultative body to the Finnish parliament and to the municipal municipalities also, uh, but it doesn't really give um, the speakers their own sort of administrative functions. Um, but they have, of course, their own party and have had for many, many years. And this has um, a normal representation in parliament through the ordinary lists and has been uh, in coalition governments uh, from time to time, quite often actually. So I move on quickly to the last one, functional autonomy. It was mentioned earlier, again, same indicators. Uh, as you will have noticed, there's no um, um, self-adjudication in these models, um, obviously, because they're not that um, uh, invested with power to do that. But here I, I, I follow again what uh, Heinze has said that functional uh, NTA, it, it's, it's based primarily on private law actors and institutions exercising the minority rights. And therefore he argues that um, it, has, it, it, it represents arrangements where opportunity and pragmatics come together to provide local management of relevant functions. Um, so uh, it may or may not rest on constitutional level recognition, but um, um, unlike, unlike the two previous one, there's no single act, whether it's, it's a, a, a primary piece of legislation or a, a national act, there's no single act which legislates uh, this specific um, model of NTA. The public law implements functional NTA through scattered, uh, scattered statutes, uh, basically across the legal framework, usually as provisions or subsections or individual clauses of public statutes. So regulating a certain sector of public administration, there might be a sub section on minority rights. So in that sense, you could say that functional NTA is based on clusters of rights. Uh, however, in as much as the organization that implement the rights are always incorporated in private law, the difference is that provisions of public law statutes regulate private institutions. And therefore we have the situation that NTA organizations provide indirect public administration. So it's similar to the administrative one, making it all more confusing. Um, so competences are therefore also uh, allocated indirectly, uh, you could say. 
So um, what I argue is that we see a type of fusion of public and private law whereby, whereby activities of private organizations take on a public institutional function through official recognition or, or similar. Um, some scholars would call this public-private partnerships, um, but uh, functional NTA is therefore likely to emanate from the bottom, in fact, only from the bottom, uh, and it may take a gradual course towards establishment of a recognized framework. And again, uh, I will just quickly go through the, the one type that I know very well, the one model that I know very well is the one in Germany in the state of Schleswig-Holstein, where um, the Danish speaking minority or the Danish minority was recognized uh, way back after World War II, um, first in the Kiel Declaration, and then later this was incorporated uh, into the Schleswig-Holstein constitutional statute of 49, and that was then transformed into the constitution of 1990 when Schleswig-Holstein got its first constitution. Um, and also at that time, they added political participation before it was mainly a cultural right. So um, this, I think, is the best example of how the fusion between public and private law happens. And in Schleswig-Holstein, it's in the area of education. So allow me just quickly to explain that. Um, again, the, the legislation on minority schools has been part of public management, uh, public administration law since 1950, uh, but the schools were not really legalized until 78. And they are currently regulated under the Education Act of 1990, which provides that, and it's basically one sentence, provides that minority schools in Tlisby Holstein are categorized as private schools or substitute schools. They call them Ersatzschulen, uh, but they hold recognition as public schools as long as they follow the, uh, the public school requirements, of course. Um, so you could say that there's no obligation to form any, perform any duties, um, but this fusion between public and private and it's difficult to explain in a sense, when does the private and the public end and begin? Uh, I think is unique uh, in the sense also that it ensures that the diplomas from the uh, Danish minority schools are recognized officially in all of Germany. So um, I have come up with a comparison and now I don't know if you can see all of these uh, different types of indicators on the entrenchment. Uh, I will not go through them, um, but I will leave it on the screen there for a moment. But basically, um, I think this comparison begins to provide, I believe, a possibility to link to some federal concepts, okay? And, and this is very technical and, and um, probably um, for most legal scholars already knowledge that they have, but those were the, the categories that I came up with using the, the indicators from the previous research uh, and also others. I, I don't explain everything today because I, I in, included also some political philosophy here in terms of the, the level of the voice that minorities have. Because again, um, the whole thing comes down to this strength of entrenchment or, or level of entrenchment and the strength of autonomy. How strong is the autonomy that a group is able to claim or has been uh, conveyed through uh, the legal framework. So in my analysis, I came up with the fact that Hungary has probably a fairly high, strong, a high, high legal and political entrenchment and therefore it's stronger. Whereas uh, the case of uh, Finland and the case of Germany, 
I would consider only medium. So this is maybe a very sort of political science approach. But then back to the questions that Nicolo has uh, so kindly and very interesting uh, sent to us before uh, joining you today. And, and I think that when it comes to the question whether NTA can be conceived as a broad federal phenomenon, I don't think we're there yet. I think that com competences are not strong enough to compare one-to-one -to, -one to federal competence. I mean, I think that's something which many would agree with me. With regard to whether uh, NTA can be seen as layers of a complex federal governance structure, yes, I think this is feasible. If we accept the notion that co-governance as a function um, that can have different degrees of strength, which I just talked about in terms of power. If we accept that, and I think we accept it, it has kept accepted in federal studies. Uh, there are very different federal systems around the world and some are very strong, some are very weak and uh, some units within a federal system have stronger powers than others and so forth. So here I'm being a little bit optimistic. Uh, and then finally, the criteria for framing NTA in federal terms. Um, I think, as I said, several of the entrenchment indicators uh, could be used in this regard. I would point out shared competences, depth of competences, nature of competences, co-governance, of course, and the strength of the autonomy. How strong is the uh, collective agency of the group in, and how um, is that group able to actually run a viable model which um, back in, in, the, in the other project we talked about resilience, uh, especially in those countries where there's a weak state uh, and groups are trying to take on their basically public service delivery for their own communities, right? So, uh, sorry if I ran too long. Thank you for the attack, attention, and I will take down my. Thank you. Thank and you I very look much. To questions. That, that was really a thought provoking presentation. There are so many issues that have been raised, but we are running uh, late, so I don't waste time. And I immediately uh, pass the floor uh, to Frederic Lepin, um, and his presentation is entitled Non-Territorial Federalism, Some Theoretical and Historical Considerations. Please, Frederic, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Paolo. I'm just, uh, Nicolo, sorry. I'm just checking I have one issue that I'm going to solve quite quickly about my slides. Sorry. No problem. Uh, if you are having uh, issues, we can also yes, switch with Carla. It doesn't update immediately. Okay, okay. We, we see it. Thank you. My slide now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Nicolo, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to be with you today to have some points of discussion about non-territorial federalism. Actually, when Paolo, uh, when Nicolo proposed me to, to go on with this topic, I thought it would be mm, quite easy to do it, and I realized that it's quite difficult to find out what has been said about the history and theory of non-territorial federalism. I would start with an anecdote as non-territorial federalism is usually linked to, uh, to uh, some kinds of uh, linguistic, cultural or ethnic uh, problematics. I would like to go back to an anecdote of 1995, I was a very young uh, employee of CIF, and I was sent to Fribourg just to participate to a meeting organized 
why then El Azar? So of course, when I write, I say, oh, I've been there for a year. Actually, it had been for two weeks. But as uh, Sif wanted to, to have a representation in that meeting, I went there and I was really shocked when Daniel El Azar recognizes the dean of the federal scholars, talked about federalism and minority rights as a form of tribalism. Yes, of tribalism. I was very surprised about that approach because it showed me somehow that federalism in the United States was not really aware of the specificities, linguistic and cultural specificities of the world. And at a, a, th a theoretical basis, which was not taking it into account as all. And I take this other example from William Livingston. Oh, sorry, I'm mistake. Livingston, of course, in 1952, in a well-known article about the nature of federalism, where he was stating that the essence of federalism not, lies not in the institutional or constitutional, the constitutional structure, but on the society itself. Uh, what was saying Livingston, if, if the diversities are grouped territorially, that is geographically, then the result may be a society that is federal. If they are not grouped territorially, then the society cannot be said to be federal. In the later case, it becomes functionalism, pluralism, or some form of corporate, corporativism. Actually, I was very surprised. And uh, it went on when I, uh, by all these remarks and somehow I forgot them. And especially for Nicolo, I started to work again on this specific theory and this specific history. And I realized that we are really missing historical links about that. But first of all, if we talk about non-territorial federalism, well, it seems quite obvious as one of the main aims of federalism is to accommodate pluralism. So it seems quite obvious. But in order to talk about non-territorial federalism, there should be a self-government directly elected with exclusive jurisdiction over specific citizens and not on the basis of the territory. It seems quite, uh, quite uh, self-evident right now, but I would say that it's not been for a long time because what it does mean is that in the same territory, two or more exclusive jurisdictions are cross-cutting. So you have the same jurisdiction, but for different people on the same territory. That's why rather than uh, when we talk about uh, non-territorial federalism. I've never seen a country based solely of a non-territorial federalism. Maybe some kind of uh, consociationalism, but not really, because there's always a territorial base. If we want to talk about territorial, uh, about non-territorial federalism, it would be more interesting to talk about the so-called federal arrangements which means that the state itself is not federal, but some people of the state are dealt by a specific government in a federal way, in such a way that they have their own government. They have their autonomy as regards to some exclusive competences to an exclusive jurisdiction. And if we go into the uh, non-territorial federalism, Actually, there are two types of federalism that can be taken into account. The first one is the so-called functional federalism, and the second one being the personal federalism. When we go to functional federalism, we can talk about cooperative federalism, cooperative, corporate federalism, or mutualism. This is when the people is organized through their economic belonging, which means the professions or the branch of activity. 
mostly economic branch of activity. And then the polity is organized according to the cooperation competition between these corporate groups. I would say that nowadays at the beginning of the 21st century, it might seem a bit um, odd, a bit strange, but actually every time people have been talking about federalism in the middle age, you can have many books of people trying to connect the idea of federalism to the middle ages, actually they always refer to the guilds, mostly in cities, in the free cities. And so when we're talking about federalism in the Middle Age, we, talk, we can talk, of course, of uh, some institutions like the Ori, Ori Roman Empire, but it's mostly through the system of, gil, uh, of uh, guilds governing together a free city. And that's actually what we find with Johannes Althusius. Everybody's always talking about Althusius as one of the founding father of uh, the federal theory, even though he's been forgotten for uh, about three centuries. Well, the federalism of Althusius, if we can call it that way, uh, was based on a functional federalism and not on the territorial one. Same approach in France with Pierre-Joseph Proudhon in the middle of the 19th century. It was the basic ideas that the, uh, of the mutualism where the basic entity of the federation would be the workshop. And then there would be a functional organization of workshops and at the same time, a territorial one, but the basic entity would not be uh, the citizenship, would not be the territory, but would be at first the activity, the profession, the branch, what was traditionally called as the functional approach. And last but not least, the, I think the last one really got into uh, that idea from a theoretical point of view was Harold Lasky, uh, uh, a British scholar and activist just before Second World War who developed the, these theories of functional federalism before decreeing that it was not time for federalism anymore. So uh, we can say, of course, that what we would call corporatism or what we would call anarchism is based on a functional federalism and that, that uh, functional federalism is the basis of contemporary trade unions. Usually trade unions are organized through a, a, a functional base, which means all the, all the workers of the same branch, are all the workers with the same profession. And they organize themselves up to the highest level where they get into the confederation, so-called confederation, which is actually the gathering of all the branch, all the activities, federations. So this is not over, even though it's not really used anymore in, I would say, in the public organization. But it went to the point when we got to the anarchist approach that the CGT, Confederation General du Travail in France, in, 19, uh, in 1895, at its very beginning, it was more Proudhonian than Marxist at the time, at the very beginning, it was really to create a country without government to make the state redundant, to have such an organization that the um, political government would not be necessary anymore. This is what we would call the first version of non-territorial federalism. It may seem as outdated nowadays, but actually not so far away, it was considered as the main approach. And when we are going through uh, English speaking literature, I take for instance, Preston King, you probably know of Preston King, Federalism and Federation. 
and he says, what are the basic varieties of federal pluralism? It's doctrine of separation of power, doctrine and checks and balances, argument for plural party systems, ideology of corporatism, device of proportional representation, doctrine of social pluralism, and doctrine of federalism. 1985. And if we look to what I would call the ancient version of uh, Wikipedia of federalism, which is a classical one as well, Concepts of Federalism by uh, William Stewart. Well, you look in the whole book and you have no mention of any kind of ethnic federalism. Every time you look at non-territorial federalism, functional federalism, cooperative federalism, or any, it's always referring to this first functional approach of federalism. I didn't even see in the index references to uh, um, Karl Renner or Otto Bauer, as I will talk about yesterday. And it's only in the 90s that the English speaking literature started to talk about, I would say, cultural, ethnical, linguistic form of federalism. And therefore, I think that the position at the time, because it changed quite quickly, but the position of the time of Dan Elazar saying that it was some kind of uh, denigatory tribalism uh, was quite relevant of what was happening at the time. The decline of factional federalism came, most, uh, came for many reasons, mostly because it was focusing on economic issues. And in theory, it's hardly compatible with a capitalist society as the capitalist society is based upon some kind of methodological individualism and the continual economic growth. The corporatism on the other side is mostly based on an approach of some uh, collective approach and some con conservative protection of the different branches and professions. But of course, the most important element of the decline of functional federalism is the welfare state. Once the state, once the government has seized all potential competencies of functional federalism, it was not necessary to keep it anymore. And it's often presented in social partnerships of social market economies but it's not anymore considered as a possible substitute for government. So why do I present it? Well, I present it for two reasons, this functional federalism. First of all, because nowadays there's another content given to what we call functional federalism. Well, I would say working properly federalism, but historically it's not that one. And the second dimension is just coming from the the, par uh, the, 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 the paradigmatic approach that Niccolo is presenting us on the way to look all the dimensions and all the approaches of pluralism and all the approaches of federalism, we never know what's going to happen in the next decades, but it might be interesting to keep in mind that there are other approach than the proper cultural approach because I come directly to what we call personal federalism, which is generally considered in the English speaking literature as the non-territorial federalism based on cultural, linguistic or religious approaches. When you try to understand why they, are, why they are talking about personal federalism, what does it mean precisely? Why the word personal? Well, actually it comes to this old tradition of the personal legal status against the general law. This personal legal status that started 
from, I would say, even the Roman Empire as the possibility for some people to derogate of the general law because of the specificities, which were at the time mostly, um, that which were at the time mostly um, li um, religious, but more and more linguistic and then cultural in general capacities. This is the thing that we find with the people that we consider as the founders of the personal federalism, which are Karl Renner and Otto Bauer, the so-called Austro-Marxists, with their national cultural autonomy, saying that within the Austro-Hungarian Austro uh, Empire, there should be a possibility for different groups. I think the main group that took, that tried to took the opportunity was were the, 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 the Jewish people, but it was for all national groups to try to say, okay, they could have their self-government dealing with cultural autonomy. And then from time to time, this idea of personal legal status came back. We can think, for instance, of the Turkish constitution giving a specific legal status to Christians into the Turkish Republic. We can think, and it was one of the surprises of the research I made, it was to see the importance of Marc Lorio, never heard about this lawyer before, in 1957. He was an obscure lawyer in Algeria, at that time, French Algeria, who proposed a personal federalism for Algeria. That is to say, give specific rights with a specific government for the Muslims in Algeria, dealing with their own religious and cultural issues. Frankly, I tried to make the connection, the genealogy between Karl Renner and Marc Lorient from the uh, French literature a bit from the German literature. And so far, I've not been able to see the link. And my position would be that, person, that when we talk about personal federalism, we're talking, the personal is making reference to the personal legal status that we can find on uh, personal legal status that we can find on um, some aspects of the uh, international law in order to protect some specific minorities, non-territorial minorities. As regards to the, oh, sorry, I left it in French at the, at, at the top for some reason, sorry about that. <laughs> for the types of competences, what are, the, what are the different competences that are usually found in personal federalism. Well, the first competence, I would say historically, is the religion, the right to have another religion than the one of the polity and to, and to self-organize it. Quickly after, were developed the idea of the specific language and a specific culture and the self-protection of language and culture through collective means and through a self-government. When we get into the 20th century, we see also the possibility of specific civil rights to have a derogatory civil one, not the same as the one of the general population. So some people would say might be uh, some reliefs of uh, past middle age organization. Well, maybe, but you can see it, for instance, in Spain. For well, people who know Spain, you have the hechos diferenciales, which means that for some autonomous communities, in addition to the rights given by the um, constitution and the uh, 
uh, statutes of the different communities, you have some specific have some specific um, rights given to some specific communities, being usually historical territories, language, civil rights, for uh, uh, the proper uh, um, police service, and a specific organization of the fiscal dimension. So it means that in the, uh, the, 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 the different com uh, communities in, uh, in the different autonomous communities in Spain, and in particular in the Basque country, Catalonia, Galicia, Navarra, Cana Can Canarias, uh, ba uh, Baleares Islands, uh, Valencia, e a and uh, Aragon, you have the possibility to have a specific right organized by the government of the autonomous community. I take one example that I know well, which is the one on Catalonia, or in Catalonia, you can choose to uh, be uh, treated according to the Spanish civil right or to the Catalan civil rights. When it comes to an heritage, when it comes to uh, marriage and things like that, it can be very different from one to the other. And this could be considered as forms of personal federalism because the same people in the same area, I would say in the same street, in neighboring houses, can belong to a different civil system. But the most important, I would say, the extreme development that has been ever made about the rights that could be considered into a personal federalism were developed in Belgium. Yeah, maybe some of you have been living in France for 27 years, but I'm still Belgian, so I have quite a memory of what has happened over there. Uh, it, 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 take, it took place in Belgium, where they decided to create the uh, language communities with specific competencies. And they decided that all competencies that could be able to be affected to specific citizens, specific persons, that's what's called the personal, it's, well, uh, it's a neologism, of course, uh, personalizable matters, which mean possible to put other specific persons, specific people, could be into the hand of this new community government. Why did they do so? First of all, because the regional governments for the one who know Belgium were, would appear only uh, about 10 years afterwards. And second, because there was, and that's the interesting about personal federalism, there was the area of Brussels where it was decided that both French speaking community and Flemish and uh, Dutch speaking community, becoming very soon the Flemish community, would have jurisdiction. So the Flemish community and the French speaking community would have the jurisdiction all together cross-cutting into the territory of Brussels. And these matters were considered, to the, I would say, to the extreme because they took into account education and research from the lowest to the highest level, the use of languages, the culture in all dimensions, health and social security, and employment and unemployment policies. You have to know that afterward, later, it has been decided that health and employment and unemployment policies were going to be sent to the regional level. Why to the regional level and not anymore to the um, and not anymore to the community one? Because basically because it was too costly. But still, there is still in 
the competencies of the communities, education and research, use of languages and culture. I think that was the extreme possibility of competences devoted to, I would say, personal federal governments. So what are the basic issues? Well, when we talk about personal federalism, the basic issue is to know who is relevant, of which law, who is relevant to which jurisdiction, because we can get very quickly into a system of, I would call it, but in purpose, in extremely as the risk of apartheid. You know, if you have your identity written on your uh, identity card, and for instance, you have a system of education, you say, okay, if you are from that identity, you go to that school, and you're not allowed at all to go to the other one. If you go, if you are belonging to that system, then you go to that hospital. We don't care if the hospital of the other community is just five minutes away, and yours is one hour away. You have to go to your own uh, uh, community system. So there's always a risk of that kind. And then I'm talking about the case of Belgium, which is quite interesting because it wanted to put together the liberal approach of, uh, of, the, the, of the classical liberal democracy and the idea of or language communities or ethnic communities. So what does it mean? It means that in, in the area of Brussels, both communities are uh, have jurisdiction and they can decide to, for instance, open an hospital. They can decide to open a school. And who can go to the school? Nobody knows because it's impossible to know if the people going to one or the other schools are belonging to a one or another community. And nobody wants to know about it. This is, the tr uh, so both institutions are working on that territory, but it's impossible to know. It's, uh, I, I would say, it's it presumably impossible because it's not taken into consideration if the people are, if the if people coming to one specific system are going from that system or the other one, okay? Second aspect, which is the most difficult, is who's paying? And when you get, where do you get your resources from? And I think it's the main issue of personal federalism. It's unless you get into some kind of apartheid system, it's very difficult to know what, uh, uh, it's very difficult to organize a system of taxes. So I'm sorry, Frederick. Almost uh, 30 minutes has have passed. Okay. Uh, would you mind uh, finishing in two two minutes, two three minutes? Because I'm very sorry. I forgot to check the time before <laughs> before start. No, no problem. And eventually, we get to the point to the paramountcy of the territorial jurisdiction. You can have many personal jurisdiction system, but whatever the case, what experience demonstrates is that the one political, uh, who has the uh, territorial jurisdiction to get the money is the one uh, having the paramountcy, political paramountcy on the system. And usually the rights are left to some minorities and time to time, they try to restrict it to the smallest territorial basis on a territorial basis where it is really impossible to be able to split it between people of different communities living together. But anyway, we're talking about federalism. When you're talking about personal federalism, whatever would have said Livingstone, because every time we're talking about giving meaning to non-centralized form of organization, we're talking about federalism. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. Uh, you gave us really enriching insights and uh, a great journey through federal ideas and uh, and through the connection that they have with minority rights and so on. But uh, again, uh, let's not waste time. And uh, I let me hand you over to uh, Karl Kussler uh, with uh, his presentation. Uh, please, Karl, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you so much, um, Nicolo, for um, giving me the floor. I will just uh, share my presentation. Um, well, I guess you can see the slide now. Yes. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, actually, my um, presentation will be very brief. Um, and I guess always the, the last presentation on the panel shall be the shortest. Um, actually, I have only have three slides. And the first slide is about the links in uh, NTA and federalism research and practice, because I guess that is important to have some context. The second one is about uh, the reconciliation of federalism with uh, NTA, which is, uh, as far as I understood it, the core of your project, because I, um, I read with great interest uh, the draft chapter that you sent me, Nicolò, and I will try to um, provide some links between those uh, two topics of NTA and federalism. Of course, I rather come from the federalism side, um, as opposed to Torpe, for example, and um, I will um, uh, provide this perspective, uh, perspective. And the third slide will be about uh, NTA federalism and uh, three uh, issues that I see as critical uh, for both uh, um, these phenomena, NTA and, and federalism. So that is the question of the, the covenant um, that binds uh, the entities uh, together. The second one is uh, the shared rule dimension. And the third one is uh, the aspect of, of democracy. So um, just to very briefly um, provide some context on um, the links between uh, uh, NTA and, and, and federalism in research and political practice. If you look at the practice of federalism, then of course there has been uh, the heyday really of uh, federalism, especially of multinational federalism after the downfall of, um, of the, the post uh, Cold War uh, geopolitical order. So there has been a revival in the 1990s, especially of multinational federalism. At the same time, however, there has also been uh, a revival um, uh, of, of NTA, which was introduced or in some cases reintroduced. I guess um, Tove also briefly mentioned the, the, the example of uh, Estonia, where there had been an NTA arrangement already in 1925, but then of course short-lived uh, only until uh, 39. Um, so there, there was a reintroduction of, of NTA, while in other cases um, there has been an introduction of, uh, of, of NTA, but especially in Central and Eastern Europe. And that is quite interesting, whereas federalism really has, um, has been established, um, multinational federalism especially, in um, countries around the world in the 1990s. Um, uh, geographically, um, NTA has been more limited. And um, the establishment of NTA, and that is quite interesting um, because that has happened, especially uh, also with the endorsement of the international community. There has been, uh, there is a very, very um, interesting and then famous and often quoted uh, uh, statement by Max von der Stuhl, the then uh, uh, OSCE High Commissioner for National Minorities, who said that uh, up until the 1990s, uh, insufficient attention has been given to the possibilities of cultural autonomy. And that also reflects actually a, a shift towards non-territorial autonomy, which is also visible Already in the 1999 um, uh, Lund recommendations, Tove has written extensively about that, about this uh, shift as well. So this statement reflects that. So there has been kind of a, um, a new attention for, for NTA. And what is the important um, um, consequence of that, as I see it, is the disentanglement between autonomy and TA, because up until then, there has been um, um, uh, autonomy has been in many circles seen as quite uh, synonymous with territorial autonomy. But then through the emancipation of NTA, uh, it has been perceived, this has come then afterwards uh, to be perceived as an umbrella term involving both TA and NTA. So um, what was interesting um, in when I read your, your chapter, Nicolò, um, was that um, you, you asked the question whether 
actually um, research on federalism and NTA are kind of non-communicative islands. And to certain uh, to a certain degree, I I would um, I would confirm that. Uh, and there is actually uh, a quite interesting statement in a, in a recent book by 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 Coakley, so uh, an NTA scholar, who says that actually the literature on NTA has been overshadowed by a much larger in, uh, literature that focuses on uh, more known strategies such as federation and consociation, and that is uh, probably the case. And it's um, certainly true that uh, especially federalism scholars, classic federalism scholars that like uh, Ronald Watts, for example, they only dealt with NTA, um, if anything, in a very superficial way. Um, so there has been this um, rather marginalization of NTA literature by um, the more robust and more comprehensive federalism literature, um, certainly. But um, there have also been uh, links that have been developing between those two strands of research. And I would say that especially also uh, we as URAC together also with uh, my co-speakers here uh, have contributed to that because I'm just thinking now um, of the workshop on non-territorial and territorial autonomy that we organized together with EU Tove uh, some 10 years ago. And then also the proceedings, um, the, the book on uh, minority accommodation precisely through TA and NTA. Um, uh, so that is one example, and uh, as I'm, I see that uh, my colleague Sergio Constantine is online, and I also see him across uh, the hallway there. Um, we also have this uh, project together again with Tove, um, um, uh, the World Autonomy's online resource uh, where various uh, TA and NTA arrangements are presented. So uh, I guess there is some nascent scholarship bringing together um, rather territorial arrangements and, and uh, non-territorial arrangements. And also Federic, he has always been in our um, International Association of Centers for Federal Studies, uh, the, the advocate and fighter for um, functional and per personal uh, federalism. So there is some link between uh, those two um, strands of research. I wouldn't say that they are really non-communicative islands, but certainly there has to be uh, done more um, uh, to integrate those uh, strands of research. So uh, let me now on the second slide focus on, um, on the core of your um, project, and, um, which is the reconciliation of uh, federalism with, with NTA. And um, I find it quite interesting that you call it um, this term that you use, uh, Nicolas, uh, federationalism. Because um, what you try to say with that is um, the problem of the equation of federalism with federation. So uh, the territorial and nation state focused uh, uh, element of federalism. So um, as I see it, so there are two um, interesting questions that we have to ask. Um, when we uh, try to find out uh, about the links between federalism and, and, and NTA. Uh, the first is whether we can overcome territoriality. And indeed, there have been uh, theorists uh, of federalism uh, who actually were quite open to non-territorial arrangements. So for example, Davis, he uh, speaks of, uh, so Rufus Davis, he speaks of a federal galaxy and within this federal galaxy, there is indeed space uh, for, uh, non-territorial arrangements as well. Um, but um, what is the problem here is, I guess, that in the end, many of the classical theorists of federalism tend to be quite ambivalent uh, towards uh, non-territorial autonomy, especially Daniel Alazar, um, who then has also quite federationalist um, uh, writings um, that, that uh, if uh, to use uh, your terminology. So, um, a second point is that is important is, I guess, is to um, recognize that there is also some territoriality uh, to all non-territorial arrangements, autonomy arrangements. Because of course, um, even the basic distinction uh, of who is a majority and who is a minority uh, always is within a certain territorial framework which is the territorial framework of the state or which is the territorial framework of a region. Because if we take also into account the internal minorities within a region, so the, the, the minorities within a minorities, for example, the Latins here in South Tyrol. Um, and another thing is, of course, that another territorial element of NTA is um, that it needs a territorial scope uh, of application. 
so which was for uh, um, Karl Renner's um, national cultural autonomy, for example, the whole Austro-Hungarian Empire. But of course, as well, he, he could as, um, um, as likely also have applied um, NT only to one of the two halves of the empire. So this is, to some extent, this, this is an arbitrary de decision to decide about uh, the territorial scope, the outer limits of the space where NTA uh, shall be practiced. And we have this uh, interesting example of um, cultural autonomy in Russia, where there is this pyramid of national cultural autonomies um, at multiple levels of government. So this is, um, there is some territorial element in NTA, but of course it is um, uh, fundamentally different because the, the, the organizational principle, the principle of organizing power is of course the personality principle as opposed to the territorial uh, territoriality principle where you have territorial entities. So be they cantons or states or provinces or lender in the case of uh, federal states. So um, the second question is then whether we can overcome uh, the notion of, um, of government levels within a nation state, because also uh, federalism, uh, this federationalism that you uh, try to challenge uh, is also linked uh, to those government levels. And here is interesting what, of, uh, what for example, one of the leading um, pioneers of federalism has to say about it, uh, Karl Friedrich, who says that actually um, non-governmental federated entities are possible. And he cites precisely the Austro-Marxists um, that are of course um, at, the, at the root and the, the most often um, referred to authors in, uh, in, in NTA literature. Uh, then, if you look at, at, at uh, constitutions, uh, what is interesting um, is that the, the South African constitution, for example, uh, does not refer to government levels, but it refers to the national and the provincial and local spheres of government, which are distinctive, interdependent and interrelated. So um, what, is, what was the reasoning behind that? was um, precisely to say, okay, these are like circles, these are like spheres, they are not like um, uh, levels, so they are not, um, there is a superior level and there are different levels, but they are like circles, um, spheres that are overlapping and there is no hierarchy. But of course, um, in the end, this is only uh, the theory because especially um, relations between the national government and the provinces in, in South Africa uh, is very much centralized, even if the municipalities have more autonomy, but uh, still there is a lot of hierarchy. So we can uh, say that certainly um, uh, this, the hierarchy that is uh, within federalism that is expressed by the level of government or also the, the term of the order of government, um, uh, there has not been an escape from that actually. So um, let me on my last slide uh, then um, just highlight three issues that I find uh, really interesting when we look at both NTA and, and, and federalism. So um, the first one is, is the covenant because the, the Ferdos, the Ferdos is of course uh, also terminologically and etymologically at uh, the root of federalism. So um, the Ferdos, the, the covenant that binds the different entities together. And here it is interesting to look at what uh, Rufus Davis again has to say about that because he says, if, if a Ferdos is there, then federalism can be any cooperative uh, association of groups whether they are territorial or not. So um, when we now look at, at the practice of NTA, and I'm looking here especially at uh, Utoba as well, um, then I'm just asking the question whether uh, we can see an element of an, a covenant in uh, the establishment of uh, NTA arrangements or aren't NTA arrangements rather granted um, because uh, the partners are just not really on an equal footing because the power constellations are um, um, quite different in most cases of NTA arrangements um, if we compare that uh, to classical federal sp states, especially coming together federal states, so aggregated federal states, uh, where there is a different bargaining position, of course, uh, between the different entities. And also that the lesser competencies that are usually involved in the case of NTA that you mentioned, uh, Tobe, before, uh, maybe also plays a role there. But probably um, uh, NTA is more likely to be rather granted and not really the, the, the outcome of a covenant. 
Of course, on the other hand, we also have to be quite critical. Um, we in federalism research uh, whether uh, actually this covenant is really true uh, and is really the, uh, the case in, 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 in classical federal states. So um, devolutionary uh, federal states, for example, like Belgium. So there has not been this, this, this big bang of a, a covenant to one constitutional assembly really bringing uh, the entities, the future entities together. But it has rather been a piecemeal process, of course, an incremental process up to the latest uh, uh, state reform in 2011. Um, but I think there we can see, and an in this whole process over, over decades, uh, we can really see maybe at what I, uh, in, on other occasions, called an ex post covenant. So not an, a historically first Big Bang uh, covenant, but uh, an exposed covenant. But of course, there are other federal states that were just put together, imposed federal states, and there um, there is no 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 covenant 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 level either. So uh, as I would argue, um, is also the case uh, for NTA. Then a quest, second um, element, uh, which is quite striking, I guess, if we um, compare uh, NTA arrangements and federal states is um, of course the question of the self-rule because that is always uh, so this, this classical dualism uh, that Elazar introduced uh, between uh, self-rule and, and shared rule. And um, um, NTA seems to have, of course, uh, a clear self-rule focus. And it was quite striking to me um, that uh, those five indicators that uh, you mentioned, Tove, all of them um, started with self. So self-organization, administration, decision, uh, adjudication. So of course it is uh, about um, autonomy in the case of NTA and not really about integration. So um, this might be something that uh, differentiates maybe uh, the two if we really see shared rule as an essential element uh, of federalism. Because on the other hand, if you look at the practice of federalism, then there is what has been called uh, Madison's paradox, um, um, which uh, clearly shows that actually uh, second chambers have been uh, quite important um, uh, representations um, of, of ter uh, territorial interests, because Madison famously said in, in the Federalist Papers that uh, the US Senate will have its powers from the states as co-equal societies. But um, in, as, as, as um, federalism practice shows, of course, second chambers do not really um, represent subnational interest in many cases, uh, but rather fo fo uh, function along uh, party logics uh, and uh, actually executive uh, intergovernmental relation formats are rather uh, taking their place, especially also uh, bilateral tools uh, of intergovernmental relations. So um, there are many um, examples for this uh, impotence of, um, of bicameralism. So the, 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 the Canadian uh, Senate, which is uh, actually nominated by uh, the, the federal prime minister, the actually dismantled uh, Belgian Senate, which uh, rather in, uh, represents um, uh, language groups and uh, rather than, uh, than territories and also lost competencies at the same time when actually federalism was implemented. So um, uh, it is hard to say then um, to really um, that shared rule is a problem uh, with uh, NTA arrangements when it is as much a problem also in federal states, I think. The last point that I would like to raise here is um, the question of democracy, which is, I guess, uh, something that um, uh, is related to both NTA and also uh, federal states. Because um, if we look again at one of the pioneers of federalism, Carl Friedrich, I mentioned him already before, then he famously perceived federalism as a species of constitutionalism and uh, constitutionalism also as a form of democratic government. So the question is then um, whether democracy is essential to uh, NTA and also to, to federal states. And um, this, of course, um, uh, um, this perception of Friedrich, uh, Friedrich as of federalism as necessarily democratic um, contrasts, of course, with certain examples of uh, NTA, uh, historical examples of uh, NTA that, uh, that can be mentioned, which have, of course, a clear democratic deficit. Um, uh, so there, uh, what can be mentioned here is that the millet system uh, within the, the uh, Ottoman Empire, just to show you this uh, slide here, 
what you can see here is uh, the extension of the millet system for believers of uh, the Jewish and Christian religions um, in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, what was the problem, however, of course, was that this was not really autonomy of those groups as a whole, but actually it was uh, between the Sultan and uh, the religious leaders. You can see here um, the Sultan Mehmed II with uh, the Patriarch. Um, so it was between two leaders and it was not really democratic. So um, it was, of course, loyalty that was owed to the, to the Sultan and also tributes had to be, um, had to be given to him. And uh, the rich lead, religious leader was responsible for that, but there was not really autonomy uh, for the whole group. But of course, on the other hand, um, if you look at federalism, um, also federal states, of course, have uh, a problem or the earliest federal states had a problem of democratic legitimacy. Because if we look here at those two pictures, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the Philadelphia Convention. And down on the right side, you can see the German princes swearing allegiance, allegiance um, uh, to the empire. Then, of course, these early examples of federal state um, had as much a problem with democratic uh, legitimacy. So uh, actually what we see here is a bunch of rather old white men being together here and, um, uh, and, and deciding on the fate of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of the federal state. So um, what I try to say here is uh, regarding democracy, it has been um, uh, quite some discussion also in a recent book by Coakley where he said that um, maybe the millet system, which is often seen as a precursor of NTA, has been uh, too uncritically seen uh, by some, maybe even has been glorified as um, an example of NTA. The same holds true also for, for, for federal states. So also we have to apply the same critical approach, of course, towards uh, early federal states. So what I would say, um, uh, first generation federal states um, before, which were established before the 20th century, so before the Industrial Revolution, before the extension of voting rights um, and uh, democratization more generally, because only then actually um, uh, those arrangements were democratized, uh, democratized and were um, gained leg legitimacy by involving uh, a broader range of people. So I guess um, this last um, uh, topic um, of democracy is something that uh, you should focus on also even more when looking on uh, when looking at NTA and, fe and federal federalism in a comparative perspective in your PhD thesis. So I will leave it at that and look forward um, to uh, Eva Maria's comments and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, it was uh, really, really interesting. And uh, your reflections on the theoretical connections and possible incompatibilities uh, between NTA and federalism really enrich our discussion and also my PhD thesis that in a way uh, underlies uh, all this uh, webinar series uh, as you uh, remembered. Um, then um, let's uh, move on immediately uh, with uh, Eva Maria so maybe we can have some uh, more time to uh, have a little discussion also. Uh, with the audience. So I'll now uh, leave the floor uh, to Eva Maria Belser, uh, who will uh, engage with some comments on the presentations. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicolo. Thank you to all the presentation presenters that have been a wonderful evening. Thank you. Um, yeah, federalism and NTA both have had and are still having a revival, but mostly separate ones, like two, two friends in the same building on the same islands, both snoring, not talking to each other. So thank you, Nicolo, for bringing us together and um, discovering all the many overlaps we have in theory and practice. I really don't think that these are non-communicative islands or even archipelagos. When I was listening to the presentations this afternoon, it more felt like a continent um, that we haven't fully explored, but somehow we both 
or different research communities live on it and move on it. Um, in a way, both aspects, both research fields have so much in common, the overall general interest, and also lots of historic links in reflection. I think one of the reasons why they have developed in separate ways is uh, also because the revival of NTA has strongly been triggered and influenced by developments in the international sphere. International minority rights, um, the United Covenants and Declarations, the more collective understanding of human rights has transnationalized the issue and has brought it into the hands of international lawyers and political scientists. While federalism has somehow remained enclosed and has seen as a purely domestic affair of states. Um, but the revival or the communication is bound to increase because um, Frederic has reminded us of Belgium and personal federalism, which has always existed, but not really brought, been brought to practice, where there is such a strong need in most countries to turn into Belgians, because even the territorially concentrated minorities and groups and communities are nowadays spread. That is due to urbanization, due people leaving their traditional origins to follow economic perspective. So we all have our Brussels. All countries have. So that brings us to the question, how we can more strongly develop a common framework of analysis? And I think um, we have gone a, far, a long way um, during this uh, webinar of tonight when we listen to Tobe V as federal scholars. Most of the framework and indicators are the ones we would be using <laughs> to identify autonomy, to look at self-organization, self-administration, uh, self-regulation and adjudication. That would more or less be the way we analyze the self-rule aspect. And then we come to the question uh, Carl has raised, what about shared rule? Um, you have uh, re reminded us of the weaknesses of bicameralism. I think in a way, our way of looking at chip rule is a bit outdated and we have been passed over by people working on NTA because we have seen that in uh, Torres' presentation. Um, there is a right to information, a right to consultation, a right to representation, a right to be heard, a right to co-government, which in many cases I'm familiar with are much stronger than what we have in a senatorial bicameral parliament. So I think uh, we as federal scholars could take a lot of inspiration from these newer, more flexible um, instruments which have been developed in NTA. Um, from here, it, the question is, how do we move further? Do we have to look for a fetus? <laughs> That's Carl has asked to do I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, it has been quite a fiction anyhow. And the bargaining power in many of the uh, territorial autonomy is probably much weaker than what we can see coming up from strongly organized non-territorial groups, which have even transnational uh, networks supported by international law. So my questions 
for the future would be how or, or to add to the ones you've raised. Um, can we bring domestic law and international law or domestic politics and international relations more closely together? The diversity we see and need to accommodate is very transnational with people having multiple identities crossing international borders. And my other question I would like to be is, um, is it right, is it the way, uh, the future path to go to focus on culture and autonomy, culture, identities, language and religion? Um, what about all the identity, different identity markers? And if I understand Nicolò's work correctly, that is also an idea we must have in the background. I very much like that Frederick has reminded us of functional federalism. And we all know about professional networks we are in and how they are getting stronger and more influential and also as a part of our identity markers. So I would like to stop here because according to the schedule, including my own, we only have eight minutes left. And I've seen there has been a, a question or a comment on the chat. But I, I, yes. I give the mic back to Nicolò. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Eva Maria. Uh, I guess that uh, all your uh, comment uh, comes down to the idea that there is a common ground and maybe uh, it's time for us to explore it. And uh, that, that was really uh, interesting and uh, sportive. <laughs> um, yes, there was kind of a, a comment uh, in the chat tab from uh, Mr. Uh, Coco. Uh, that um, talked about uh, Nigeria uh, and that uh, that Nigeria had a very well established traditional institutions that uh, falls under uh, the discourse of non-territorial autonomy. I don't know whether uh, Mr. Koko would like to add something more uh, on this comment. Uh, he is uh, absolutely welcomed. Okay, uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. I'm very grateful. Uh, I think the point I was trying to make is uh, I find the presentation very interesting. In fact, this is the first time I've uh, come across this uh, non-territorial uh, authorities. And uh, to a very large extent, I believe uh, they played a very uh, important role uh, in federations in managing uh, challenge, emerging issues. Uh, much more than even the uh, uh, territorial authorities uh, because of uh, certain peculiarities, most significantly maybe issues that have to do with uh, socio-cultural issues and values. Uh, so you find people very easy to relate. Uh, and I think the traditional institutions in Nigeria were very well established, much, much longer before the colonial administration. In fact, to an extent, uh, the cause of the versatility of this uh, traditional administration, when the colonialists came, they introduced what they call indirect rule system, whereby they were ruling through the traditional uh, administration. And virtually all the lawmaking function, taxation, service delivery were uh, done through this uh, traditional uh, administration. And also law, law enforcement, uh, they have a well-established judicial system which they were using. Unfortunately, uh, as uh, 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 formal government institutions come to play, uh, to an extent they were downplayed, to the extent whereby now they are not fully recognized. And I was very interested and, uh, and amazed by the presentation when you talk about the different models of role which they can perform, the traditional model specifically. Uh, now, the battle line is there has been serious agitation presently in Nigeria to co-opt this traditional system into the mainstream of governance function. However, the greatest challenge now has been what specific role do they play? 
do we give them legislative function? Do we give them judicial function or executive function? But to a very large extent, even as it is now, given the security challenge confronting uh, the, the country, they still play a very important role in peace building, peace management, settling dispute among families, and so many other issues. But unfortunately, the greatest challenge now is how do we co-opt them into a governance system? Uh, one of the most important uh, significant challenge has to do with in co-opting them, where do you place them? Do we place them under, for instance, the local government? Nigeria is a three-tier uh, federal structure. We have the federal, the state, and the local government. At the moment, they are under the local government. And in many instances, they offer advisory roles. But the only function they play now is pure, merely advisory. And it is not uh, uh, most often being taken into consideration. And in fact, the way they are even handled now, they have been politicized, so to say, because any politician seeking any political power need to get their blessing, need to take their blessings. So it's, it's a kind of interwoven system. We accept them, we recognize them, they played a role. However, how do we now streamline them in the formal governance structure? And one fundamental thing now is financing, because to a very large extent, how do you finance them? Do you finance them from the budget? Uh, and if you are to finance them from the budget, do you hold them accountable? If you are to hold them accountable, it also touches on the values, the constant, and the traditions of people. So these are, I think, a very interesting uh, topic. I believe uh, perhaps uh, researchers in our federalism in Nigeria uh, needs to also take this uh, into a serious consideration. Because one last thing, very important thing now, you find out that non-governmental organizations, civil society, uh, donor agencies, for example, uh, polio, when polio eradication was uh, introduced into Nigeria, polio eradication, that's the immunization, was only successful because the traditional institutions were co-opted. They sanitized, they sensitized people, they enlarged, in fact, they engaged in even administrating the product themselves because there was this hesitancy that the polio vaccine is meant to create more problem than to solve the problem in, in, in Nigeria. And also issues like malaria, fight and the rest. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. And I look forward to seeing your uh, subsequent research of this area. Thank you for the opportunity to the organizers. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. That was uh, really an interesting contribution uh, that Meg uh, begs so many uh, further questions uh, about recognition, institutionalization of uh, also bottom-up forms of non-territorial autonomy. I guess that the lesson we can draw from uh, Toby Malloy's work in this moment is that uh, we have to also to challenge the idea that institutionalization is always uh, the solution. Because sometimes maybe uh, we, we see resilient form of non-territorial autonomy, uh, uh, even though they are not uh, recognized in a, um, so to say, in a, in a really formal way or a constitutional level and so on. But maybe they could be expression of uh, uh, constitutional principle. For example, in the Italian legal framework, we speak about uh, uh, horizontal subsidiarity. I don't know if Tove would like to uh, add something to this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the interesting comment. I, I, um, I mentioned that we were trying in our project to include many more countries, but uh, we also found that in, in some cases, it was difficult to actually find scholars who were working on it from our perspective. But one of the reasons why we ended up actually evaluating or assessing the resilience of these emerging NGOs, uh, uh, NTAs models, what was precisely this, this risk of co-optation, which uh, you see in many uh, uh, systems, especially systems that are not democratic, if you will, or 100% democratic or states that are weak with, with uh, a strong uh, single party ruling government or what have you. This, this is what we heard from the scholars that we were in contact with, 
that um, there were these examples, which for us then were a little bit difficult to uh, include because they were sort of blocked a little bit because of this, uh, this risk of co-optation and not being able to actually study um, whatever was there presented in front of us. So, so I, I, I appreciate very much that comment regarding this, um, if you will, res re resilience that is necessary in order that an AT NTA arrangement, as well as an, an TA arrangement, of course, can become strong enough to actually uh, survive and be permanent. Because, I mean, we even see with um, situations of self-rule uh, here in Europe that they are, they, they are given and they're taken away. I mean, we see Northern Ireland, for instance, and, and there are other small examples like that. So uh, the resilience uh, was very important to us uh, in the end, and it was something we developed along uh, the line as we were discussing these cases with the scholars who were describing them and who knew them best, of course. Uh, the other example was um, uh, the Palestinian NGOs in Israel. Uh, there you also have a situation that um, they, it's a very volatile situation and sometimes uh, they are just not able to function, other times they disappear. And we were a little bit in doubt as to whether it was even a viable example to use, but it, it turned out that we, we agreed to include it. Um, so yes, uh, there are many, many, I mean, I think we have a, a long uh, travel in front of us to, to excavate many of these interesting examples uh, across the world. We, we looked also at, at Central and South America and there are some good examples in Bolivia and in other uh, areas uh, that we could not include, but I really hope that we can continue this kind of work and, and find more scholars, you know, young scholars who are working on this and asking themselves the questions that we try to do. Uh, so thank you very much for that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't want to abuse uh, too much uh, everyone's patience. Uh, so uh, last call, uh, if there are other questions or comments. Otherwise, uh, we can put this webinar uh, to an end. Um, there's only uh, a comment again from Mr. Coco that uh, tells us uh, the um, political settlements approach offers us a fascinating explanation in this, uh, in this regard, uh, uh, as far as he is concerned. Um, well, I think we can, uh, we, we can stop here uh, with this webinar, but uh, really the hope uh, is that this could be really a first step, uh, a first step for a deeper uh, exploration of these uh, fields and to discover the, the stretches of sand that, uh, federal, that connect federalism and the law of diversity as an archipelago. Uh, I think that uh, it is worth it, and this webinar series has uh, proved it um, in many ways, and um, I hope that this uh, also would be a great opportunity to uh, enlarge the network uh, of uh, so far not that much communicative violence, <laughs> in a way. So thank you very much uh, to everybody. Uh, it was really a pleasure to uh, host uh, this webinar series. And again, thank uh, a special thank to Petra Malfertainer and Martina Trettel that were really, really supportive and helpful. Thank you and have a nice evening.